This is Her Majesty, the Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. And she's a lovely individual, just very kind. Um, you know, we got a few moments to speak with her, but she is here, you know, that's our mayor. And they got to go on a bike ride. I just love that she came to Austin. There's me in the blue. It, it was just lovely. And I love that they are so willing to share what they've learned and how they've designed things because I just really felt, you know, that they really want every every city that wants to do this to be able to implement these types of design changes. And so, you know, things really stuck with me from from that um, from that trip that we took in 2019 because they talk about you know interior neighborhood speeds versus connector road speeds to highway speeds, and that you really should not be having you know these high speed traffic situations in a really dense downtown area or in the middle of a neighborhood. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman and that is council member Paige Ellis from District 8 here in Austin, Texas. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, to welcome Paige back into the podcast for a discussion about active mobility and uh, she's running for office again. So we'll talk a little bit about her, uh, her platform. And it's always such a joy and pleasure to catch up with council member Ellis. So let's get right to it. Paige, thank you so much for joining me once again on the podcast. Thank you for having me on the podcast. I can't wait to catch up. You've been on the podcast before. I think it was episode number 72 or something like that. It was way back in uh, the spring of 2021. And uh, so much has happened. Uh, we're now in a video format, which is super cool. And uh, and and the other, th there's been a lot of updates. Uh, so why don't we do this? Why don't, uh, for those in the audience that... Uh, may not have listened to the very first podcast and may not have any idea who you are. <laughs> Why don't you just introduce yourself real quickly? I am Paige Ellis. I am happy to represent District 8, which is Southwest Austin. So this is a district that's very environmentally friendly and cares a lot about protecting our open space and trying to do our part to fight climate change. Fantastic. I love it. And, um, so in 2021, you were about halfway through your your first four year term, and uh, we're we're now <laughs> in 2022, and we're heading into the fall and election season. And uh, so you're you're running again. You you didn't have enough. <laughs> I know. I know. There's there's more work to be done. And what I've started sharing with people is we've accomplished so much in the first four years, and I know I can accomplish more in the next four because now now we have the wind in our sails. A lot of projects are rolling out, and it's time to go big. It's time to do really important, meaningful changes in the community and really make that impact on future generations. Yeah. And uh, we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into your platform in, in just a little bit. But uh, I did want to just, uh, you know, kind of frame that uh, because we, we're going to we're going to get this episode process and get it out there uh, just before the early voting starts uh, in the election. But as I mentioned to you before, uh, we're an international audience. So we're going to be talking about some stuff that's uh, that's global in nature and and very pertinent, not only to, to Central Texas, but also uh, uh, you know, across the country and around the globe. And so that that's all good. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to, to really kind of, you know, set this up on is uh, really kind of, of getting a, a little bit of a, a touch base, a touchstone in terms of, um, you know, the reasons why you originally ran for office and um, and and you, you said it earlier, just a moment ago, that you know there's still work to be done. So talk a little bit about that. You know, take us back to the beginning. Why you 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 know originally ran for office, and why you're still so passionate about continuing to to serve the you know the city here. Well, Southwest Austin, which has been my home for over a decade now is extremely environmentally sensitive. It's the home of Barton Springs and the Greenbelt and a number of different amazing parks that we have throughout our community. So we're extremely lucky to be able to have this green space accessible to a lot of individuals. Um, but we hadn't seen a Southwest Austin representation that was passionate about the environment. 
Um, the city did a plastic bag ban um, years before I was on the dais, and there, you know, there were individuals who voted against that. Um, we care about minimizing our impact and our footprint for future generations, and so um, I thought that it was really important in 2018 to really focus on how do we grow sustainably as a city and how do we balance that with open space protection. And so a number of the initiatives that I've worked on have been trying to blend a better live work play balance throughout our community so that people can walk and they can take public transportation. And a lot of our neighborhoods already have bike pathways built into their communities, but they just don't connect to each other. And so the great thing about being able to learn from other communities that are tackling these same issues is that sometimes other people have really great solutions that we just hadn't thought of yet. And so it's amazing to share those ideas and to try to find a workable balance in a community that is very environmentally sensitive, but has a lot of car and traffic congestion. So I think we can do a lot of good work if we just pinpoint the right gaps to fill and then do things like layering in incentives for e-bike purchases and try to provide bigger rebates for people who want to make that mode shift. I think that's how we're really gonna set ourselves up for success in the future. So even though there's a lot behind us, there is still so much more ahead of us. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to pull up your your platform page here on, on the website, and uh, and there you go, right off the bat. And the very first uh, button is the environment, then housing affordability, road safety, um, abortion, gun safety, emergency services, and and homelessness. Um, it, when I look at those top three, you know, features right here in terms of the environment, um, housing affordability, and road safety. You know, it just takes me right back to that trip that you and I were on in uh, in the Netherlands, and we saw the the powerful impact that having integrated cycle networks and transportation systems, trans, transit systems, can have in terms of encouraging people uh, to be able to, um, you know, decrease their household, you know expense levels, you know, they don't have to support a multiple car payments and, you know, being able to use a bike and use transit and, uh, and having truly safe networks, not just, not just cycle paths and, and sidewalks, but entire networks of separate, uh, mobility networks. And so when I see that, I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, I can see how the stuff that you've been working on so hard, you know, in terms of active mobility, you know, hits those top three things of environment, housing, affordability, and road safety. Talk a little bit more about that and maybe, you know, think back to that 2019 trip to the Netherlands and, and how that, you know, helped influence your, your platform and your thinking. That's what's really great about trying to do more with, you know, bicycle mobility and walkable communities is that you get a double benefit. You're not just protecting the environment, but you are lowering your family's um, help. You're increasing what you can do with the budget that your family has. And so the number one cost of a family budget right now is housing. And the second biggest cost is their transportation, how they commute to and from work, how they pick up their kids up from sports practice and the other extracurricular activities that they do. And so when you create this situation where people can use you know, something other than a car for trips to the grocery store, you know, going to your place of worship, those types of trips, if they're close enough to you, you no longer have to be a two car household. We also have to look at the people who want to move to Austin and people who come from communities that have great public transportation already, sometimes buy a car to live in Texas. My husband did this when he moved to Texas 10 years ago. He didn't need a car where he was, but he bought a car because he was moving to Austin. I would love for people who are already used to using public transit to be able to come into our community and not feel like they have to add another car onto the road. So luckily we have the Project Connect, you know, light rail and rapid transportation buses that passed in November of 2020. And I sponsored the $460 million bicycle and sidewalk and urban trail infrastructure bond at the same time. So we have a lot of big projects that are rolling out over the next you know, six to 12 years that are gonna really make a big impact on, on how people are, are changing their commutes. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna pull up a, a little bit of footage from um, the video that I produced from our, our trip to the Netherlands. And 
um, I'd love to have you, as this is just playing in the background, I'd love to have you just kind of like talk a little bit about that experience and, and how that, you know, really, I, I think it, it, I got the sense that it, it added an even more, uh, you know, a little bit more passion and a little bit more, because soon after that, you, you, you talked about the, 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 the bond, you know, the, the $460 million bond. I mean, shortly after, you know, getting back from the trip, you know, that got, you know, you, you helped, you know, sponsor that, get it out there. I think you were the lead sponsor of getting that forward. Um, mm-hmm. So I'll just kind of play this, but have you just reflect a little bit about how important that trip really was for you? I mean, this is really just learning about the space that each transportation mode occupies Obviously, when you're in the Netherlands, there's space that's designated for cars. There's space that's clearly designated for bikes. And then you even have the sidewalks next to it. So you don't end up with those conflicts where a cyclist is using a sidewalk. And there's that conflict between pedestrians coming out of retail shops or trying to get across. We also learned a lot about places where bicycles are invited and welcomed in versus places where they're tolerated. There's a lot of spaces locally where we're trying to transition from you know, biking in the shoulder of what's essentially a storm drain um, that may have debris and asphalt and rocks and things in the way that are unsafe for cyclists and really separating how that bicycle infrastructure works. And there's a lot of other layers of speed limits, um, raised pathways where the bicycle essentially is at grade and the car feels like there's a little speed bump. So all of a sudden the car gets the signal. It needs to slow down and be respectful of the mode of transit that's being prioritized there. So I I think these are really important mechanisms to make sure, you know, a lot of people say they are worried about trying cycling locally because they feel unsafe. So where you can have these separated pathways and really um, lower the speed limit of cars, all of a sudden it's more net the pedestrians and the cyclists to own that space and have that right of way. Right. Yeah. Now in our first, uh, interview, the first episode, uh, we, we talked a little bit about how personally it, it kind of changed something for you too. What happened like <laughs> literally the, the next day when you, uh, when you got back? I remember a night city we were in, but news was coming out locally about some groups that really wanted to push an infrastructure project. And there were, um, there was the wheel deal and then there was Austin outside and they were kind of two factions of very similar interests that said, we need to couple the light rail plan with, with better first mile, last mile, mile connectivity, or we're not going to really be able to use it. So while we're all sitting on the plane coming home, we all have our phones open. We're all Googling bicycles to buy. And so I was able to get this one from REI. I still have it. Um, this is actually a Trek model, but it's a Dutch style. And so I've, I've joked with some of my friends who have started to participate in the, the Mama Jamma rides mm-hmm. um, that raise for, you know, women's healthcare issues. And I said, I want to do that, but do I need to buy another bike? And they said, no, someone was on that, on that bike ride a month ago and they had a Dutch style bicycle, they had a cruiser. And so I said, I don't need an extra bike. Um, And what I love about this style is, you know, a lot of times in Austin, the people who are cycling are very avid cyclists and they may ride competitively um, and they may only use that for their mode of transportation. And so there was this disconnect between, you know, someone who can ride a bike and someone who is, capable of doing a triathlon and a lot of people felt like, well, I'm not going to go, you know, put on the whole bike kit and the logo spandex and, you know, have the sportiest, most expensive bike that I can afford. There's a lot of folks that have had to learn that, you know, as long as you're wearing things you can bicycle in, you can, you can do this and you don't have to be fast. Um, You don't have to be competitive, um, but you can adopt this type of, you know, transit and I love it when the when the weather cools down I'm out on my bicycle every weekend just riding around running errands you know catching up with friends and it's it's much more fun than driving (laughs) yeah 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 absolutely and 
there's your bike. Having fun in the park. <laughs> that, ACL, that was the year that ACL wasn't able to happen in person. And so they still put the flags up. So people yeah. were still riding their bikes to the park and taking pictures. But we all had to watch ACL Fest from home that year. Right. Yeah, yeah, that, that was that was the year. Um, I have a, a, a few photos of uh, the experience there in, in the Netherlands. So we'll just kind of, um, you know, slide through a few of them. And 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 this is the group in, in Utrecht, uh, so the entire group that was on that. And one of the things that, uh, that I have noticed in the months, uh, you know, that have passed since that 2019 trip is how profound that experience was for so many of the attendees. Um, I just recently had an opportunity to interview um, former director Rob Spiller, and he was on the uh, on the podcast, and he talked about how powerful and how impactful that was. Talk a little bit about, you know, that experience and, and, and how it really, uh, you know, obviously it, impacted you enough you bought a bike <laughs> but what are some of the other lingering things now that uh, were, were a, a few years out from it what what has remained for you well i think what's important is there's a lot of folks that just simply don't have access to knowing what good bicycle infrastructure looks and feels like and getting to really submerge yourself in this type of mentality all of a sudden you have a clearer picture of where you want to be and you start to think about locally, what policies can we change? You know, what, what kind of community buy-in do we need to get that if we're going to be building this infrastructure, we want it to be helpful for the communities it's intended to serve. If you just put a bike lane in and people don't want it there, then it's not going to get used. And we want to make sure that we're using our time valuably and our dollars valuably. Um, but when I was on that trip and these ideas about extra infrastructure bonds came about, you know, my first inclination was, are we going to end up not getting votes for Project Connect because people will choose one or the other mm -hmm. and one has a bigger price tag, one has a lower price tag. And, you know, I heard from a number of the folks on the trip that they really are good partners together. And there were things that we put into that, like safe routes to school, sidewalks, Vision Zero programming, uh, helping repair some of the roads that are going to be carrying public transportation routes that just weren't, they didn't have sidewalks, they didn't have stormwater drainage, some of the things that you need to incentivize use of public transit. Yeah. And so I, I was convinced on that trip by a number of the folks that that were participating that, that we should put it on the ballot. and. So we did. It was a scary leap, but it passed, you know, with with great majority. And so we're very excited to have those dollars to be able to do this. You know, we had plans. We had sidewalk plans and, you know, bicycle all ages and abilities network plans. And we just didn't have the dollars to build them. So a lot of the work had already been done. We just needed the financial component to get it to get it moving. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been interesting to see, too, how um, not only did both of those bonds pass overwhelmingly, um, but it's been interesting to see how in, in the, the years that have, you know, passed since that time, um, the, as, as we're starting to, to see stuff going down on the ground and, and plans are starting to solidify and uh, when we last spoke on, um, uh, on in episode 72, um, it, we were still sort of in the midst of the pandemic. And so we also were scrambling to do some you know, healthy streets in initiatives and some pop up uh, infrastructure and the Congress Avenue um, uh, protected bikeway was was an interim sort of pop up quick. Let's get something out there. Talk a little bit about that because there's there's those two different things of the lighter, quicker, cheaper. Let's do this. This is kind of an emergency, you know, all hands on deck. Let's do this. But then there's also this other side, which are these capital dollars, which are much slower, much more in intentional, and uh, and take a while to to happen. Um, talk a, a little bit about from your experience because you were you were right there. You were you know part of that initiative and, and that push to do something quickly in the moment, but at the same time not keep not not lose sight of the fact that this other stuff has to be built. Right. And so during the pandemic, obviously when you know nobody was driving out on the roads, 
Uh, the transportation department actually deployed two of what we call locally healthy streets um, right off the bat. And one was over the Longhorn Dam Bridge near the Holly plant. Um, the other one was along Riverside, which runs parallel to one of our most popular parks in the city, which is Auditorium Shores, got a wonderful dog park and is oftentimes um, used as a, a concert venue or festival venue. And so those shut down very quickly. And we started hearing from other communities that they were doing things like open streets or slow streets, and everyone kind of had their own take on what it meant. But we really wanted neighborhoods to step up and say, I want to close my street down. You know, um, neighbors could still get in to get to park in front of their house or their driveway if they needed to, but it was generally a no car zone. And one of them was doing street painting and, and sidewalk chalk art and just really using that space. And you know, we started getting emails right away, protect our healthy street, we want our healthy street. Um, not every neighborhood did that. There were a few that said, we don't like it. We don't hate, you know, take it away. And yeah. so we had to get really creative with how quickly they could be deployed. And since then, we've um, there's still, I think, two healthy streets that are still operating that people love. Um, but there's also opportunity for play streets, living streets, block parties, some of those other programs that are more about long term engagement with the, the streets or using cul-de-sacs for a kid's birthday party. And how do we make that easier for people? Because oftentimes it's just pavement and it's not really that useful for how many cars use it. And I like to remind people that the streets are public spaces as well. They're publicly funded, they're open to everybody. And if people want to use it more creatively, we should be encouraging that. Yeah. Yeah. And you and I had this discussion in the first episode too, about, you know, in that Dutch network, we experienced the fact that yes, there were the protected and separated facilities, but 60 to 70% of most of the network is actually some form of shared space. And so mm -hmm. you really looked at that, that reality of its speed mitigation and traffic calming and, and, and really sort of communicating that, you know, Hey, uh, we, we have to figure out a way to get along here, <laughs> you know, regardless of your mode, whether you're walking or biking or, or scootering or in a motor vehicle. And uh, you and I talked about the fact that in, in our neighborhood here, we have no sidewalks. And so every day, 24-7, 365 days of the year, it's a shared space. Mm -hmm. And so we have to figure out how to be able to, to, to get along. And uh, um, I re-listened to the episode this morning and I was like, I was reminded that I said, you know, it was, the, it was like a tenfold increase in the number of people walking and biking and scootering in the streets um, and the number of motor vehicles came down, I can tell you now here in 2022, it's still that way. We're still seeing the, the numbers of people walking, biking and, and scootering and pushing baby strollers and, and, and everything else, um, you know, is, is still there. And it's been interesting, almost magical to see how it's had a calming effect on the motor vehicle driver behavior. Talk a little bit about that in in terms of as a city council member too, of you know needing to to have that reality. There's there's not enough budget, you know, even though we have those capital dollars, there's still not enough budget and necessarily time to like have you know the protected situations everywhere. We're going to have shared space, you know, situations. How 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 do you navigate that from from a council member perspective? Um, you know, when there's that concerned that that's not safe when we commonly get brought these issues where we're trying to figure out what is a policy direction as someone who can change laws and change you know how how we're setting policy at the city council level um, but at the same time there's criteria manuals that the engineers are using to try to make sure that spaces are predictable that we're not you know making special rules for you know one part of town or another part of town um, but I have found that transportation and public works are very much open ears. They want to understand what is it that the community needs are and how can we be more responsive um, as departments to be able to meet those needs. And so, you know, we, we think a lot about the policy level and obviously we adopt the budget. So we have a great amount of control over 
you know, how much money the departments have, how much staff they have. If we want to create new programs, we may need to find, you know, more money for our full-time employees to be able to do that. Um, so we, we respect, you know, what the engineers have to be able to map out, but there are interesting conversations at the policy level where, for instance, when we talk about corridors and we know there's going to be more walkability, bikeability, you know, yes, there's going to be car traffic, public transportation, you know, we want to make sure there's more people close to those corridors um, so that they have more access to transportation. But there's also the flip side of this. And I got to meet with Secretary uh, Buttigieg when he was in town a couple of weeks ago. And I had this idea that I had never thought about before. And it was just a way of talking about how can we make sure more people have access to the urban trail network? Why are we only thinking about the car centric part and putting all the public you know, transportation aspects uh, where the cars are, where we've got beautiful parks with long urban trails connected through the city. And maybe we should kind of flip that upside down and think about more people being able to use the bicycle network instead, where you're completely separated from cars. You're not sharing that space. You're, you're biking through a park to work. And that is a much more pleasant experience than trying to share that space with vehicles. So it's just something we're thinking about. But it's, it's always good to kind of get a gut check and say, well, maybe there's another angle that we could be considering here. Yeah, I mean, and I think that the city is doing a really tremendous job of of making that connection. The, 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 the folks in the, you know, Active Transportation and Street Design Division work very, very closely with the Urban Trails, uh, you know, group over in Public Works. And you see that integration, and we've we've seen the opening of some just really tremendous um, facilities uh, recently. And I'll pull pull one up here that you know recently opened, and uh, I love this too because it's got the 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 Dutch <laughs> uh, style sort of coloring of of the of the cycle track uh, portion of this here. And so this is exactly what you're saying is you know that connectivity of leveraging. Um, you know, some of the park space and some of the other rights of way. This is a, a longer corridor where you see the le- red line is, is just off to the left there. And the great thing about this is it also touches upon something that else that you and I had talked about um, in uh, the previous episode, which is the integration with transit. And so this trail, this pathway, not only is it integrated with the on-street network of facilities, but it's also connecting right to the MLK station and, uh, and, a, and a wonderful enclosed uh, facility for locking up your personal bike there. You can jump onto the uh, onto the rail and head either north, <laughs> all the way up to Leander, or, you know, head, uh, you know, back downtown into where the convention center is. Um, talk a little bit about that, because I think that's I think that's kind of what you were just talking about there in terms of that, you know, leveraging even more of this con- off street network uh, and, and, and making sure that it's connected to the on street network. Yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity there because I think that, you know, some of the infrastructure, you know, we're, we're just in a moment where a lot has been done, but so much more is going to be happening in the future that people all of a sudden are realizing that transit by bike is actually an option or getting to that public transportation rail line is going to be an option for them. Um, So there's a lot of work to be done. And I kind of love how we're still figuring out there's some of the bike paths that are uh, painted green, like in the transportation right of way on the roads and in those intersections. And then the other ones are red. And so we're kind of still trying to figure out even just between departments, okay, how are we going to signal to the user this is a bike lane? How are we going to do wayfinding? How are we going to um, prioritize where the gaps are that need to be filled? And so I think it's really interesting that there's there's still a lot to be done. Um, but I've been really impressed with how many of the newer developments are building in really good bike lanes now where we didn't have them before. And I hope that we can get into a space of having kind of the heat censored bicycle right of way you know, where if you're a pedestrian, you have to hit the button to to cross the street, um, that in the Netherlands, they have these heat censored ones or motion censored so that they you just pull up and it knows there's a cyclist there. And so um, underneath I-35, they've actually, you know, 
this is in TxDOT right of way. This is our Department of Transportation that solely focuses on car behavior um, is trying to get into this space of being a better partner when bicycles are crossing um, the right of way for for a highway or an, an you know underpass or an access road of some sort. And so I think this is really where we're going to see people find that comfort level and feeling like, oh, how do I get, you know, from my neighborhood to my job? And then, you know, maybe I do take the scenic route back because it's all connected and I can still access what I need. Um, but by and large, I think most people are just much more comfortable with bicycling through a park than, you know, bicycling along the street, even if it's separated. Um, you know, it gets really hot here in Texas. And so I think bringing people into those green spaces is much more welcoming. Yeah, yeah, it sure is. And uh, in we, we talked a little bit about that integration with, with transit. So I've got a little bit of video here that uh, that exemplifies one of the newer uh, additions to the downtown area, uh, basically rolling right past uh, our convention center and the brand new uh, downtown station. You mentioned Project Connect, and we've got the additional uh, rail uh, tracks that have been integrated here. And I, talk a little bit about how important this is for the city of Austin. I feel like we're like getting cosmopolitan here <laughs> and this is a really amazing network and you'll see you're coming up right here on a place that actually has a bicycle green light so you yeah. actually get your own bicycle go ahead yeah um, separate from the car traffic and what's really cool about this area is it's connected you know the convention center was just there on the right hand side that's kind of the terminus of the the red line that is our um, our train line right now and so you'll take this area where it's well marked and you know has its own space clearly delineated. You have lots of company, so you're going to see pedicabs and you're going to see people on scooters, people on bikes, you know, owning this space. It's going to go under a highway, um, and then if you keep taking it further and further, the bike lane kind of drops off, and you're essentially bicycling on a street that honestly needs a lot of repair. It's a bit rocky. There's lots of potholes, but there's no cars on it because it's so rocky. So it actually right. is kind of nice. It's traffic um, calmed. <laughs> it, it, natural traffic calming. Um, th there's another street you know, nearby that, that is more well-maintained, but bicyclists can use that space. This is the access road of the highway. So this is I-35 running through central you know, downtown Austin. Um, but you keep going and it gets into better bicycle network again, takes you all the way out to 183 where they've repurposed an old, probably historic bridge. And when they moved the road off that bridge, they kept it in place and they turned it into bicycle pedestrian only. And so I think that's a really great way of saying, let's not lose the infrastructure that is charming and historic. Let's activate it, you know, even when we move the cars off of it and you can get great pictures of the Colorado River, you know, east of town. Everybody thinks of Town Lake or Lake Austin, but there's really yeah. beautiful ecosystems on the east side that I would have never noticed as a car motorist. So it's just a really cool, you're going from downtown to this TOD that is, um, you know, just east of 35. You know, you've got, that's a metal scrapyard. You know, you're just really yeah. seeing so many cool things happening in this short amount of time. And you can just play. Sometimes you just bike around. You're, you're not aiming to go anywhere. You're just on your bike having yeah. fun. Yeah, and that's and that's a little plaza that had been made. It used to be a through street, and now it's a, a bike and pedestrian only area. And the thing that I always just marvel about as I'm rolling down uh, this stretch of, of the fourth street uh, infrastructure is uh, just the amount of housing that is here. It's mm -hmm. it, you mentioned it earlier. It's a TOD, uh, a transit oriented development, and uh, we just see because we need that. I mean, that was uh, again second thing on your on your list there was uh, w uh, the need for housing and so being able to have um you know high quality housing in that sort of dense uh, area there that's easily walking and biking scootering distance um and it, that's that's so incredibly important for not only austin but for every city globally if we're right. going to meet some of those climate goals that, that we were talking about when we were talking about the environment. 
Right. And this, these are perfect, you know, homes and apartments where people don't need a car. They can get on the train, bike, walk, wherever they need to go. What's interesting about some of those little plazas is the conversation around fire safety and fire department trucks. It's one of the things we saw in the Netherlands. Their trucks are much smaller. Um, and so here in Texas, there's been a, a long time case for we need really big, wide roads because we need the fire trucks to be able to get in. Well, some of the neighborhoods in southwest Austin, the roads are so big that people are driving 50 miles an hour down the road because they're cutting through the neighborhood. They're tired of sitting at the red light, so they're cutting down a neighborhood street. Um, but those little plazas on the east side can be activated if the fire department needs to show up to do anything. And so it's a really creative way of saying this is not a car space, but it is open to everybody else and even the fire department or EMS should they need to be getting through that area. So I think it's a brilliant way of really incentivizing the people who are going to live here or work here to, to utilize another form of transit. Yeah. So in our first episode, uh, we also talked a little bit about uh, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, i.e. Uh, I-35, that <laughs> rips right through the middle of downtown. And so I'll play this uh, segment again. Um, talk a little bit about this challenge that is I-35 and where you and, and the, the rest of the council are coming down on what do we do with this mess? Because it, it truly is a mess. It is. And there is a local joke. I'm born and raised in Texas. And our local joke is that I-35 in its entirety will always have a construction project. So if you're trying to drive from the north end to, to the south end, some city is always tearing it apart and rebuilding it and diverting roads and creating you know more congestion until the project is finished. And so it's just basically a rotating you know, construction project. And it's been that way my entire life. And, and um, you and you grew up on one of the I-35 corridors in San Antonio. I did. I did. I grew <laughs> up in San Antonio. I went to school in Denton, Texas for two years. So I used to know where all the coffee shops were along the way because I needed to, <laughs> to get a little caffeine for the rest of the trip. Uh, but what, what's happening right now is that through downtown Austin, um, actually all of Austin, but everybody's focusing on the central portion of I-35, and we're trying to take notes from some of our other big cities like Boston or Dallas, other places where they've looked at the aspect of, can we bury this highway or can we um, you know, make this better for other generations and not make it worse? So TxDOT, our you know, Department of Transportation that you know, focuses on highways, doesn't have a good background of trying to create walkable communities. They yeah. just very directly say, how many cars are we pushing through? We need how many lanes? Okay, let's go do it. And as a state agency, they have a lot of leeway to eminent domain properties. There's um, a feeling of no matter how much public input and public comment goes into the, the open periods where they're accepting that comment, that they don't always change their designs based on that community feedback. And so... What we're trying to do here locally is um, either bury the road, do cap and stitch. So we would essentially put, you know, concrete platforms over the highway. And right now, one of their plans has the access lanes staying at grade. Um, but instead of being separated on both sides of the highway, they'd put them together. And that way it would have a little more of a boulevard feel, especially if you end up with the park space through capping or providing stitches along the way. Um, so we're looking at how we're going to do that. Um, we're going to have to figure out, you know, alternative funding mechanisms to do this. But the truth here in Austin and in so many other cities is that these highways were purposefully built to divide communities. Right. And a lot of cities have redlining where in Austin, it was the east side. If you were a person of color, you had to be on the east side. And we're fortunate that we have really resilient communities that are well connected and vocal to say this is not right. And if you don't do this carefully, you're gonna further that divide where people who are trying to get across a highway are injured, um, have to buy a car because it's not safe for them to walk or bike. Um, but we've seen this in many other communities where the highways and the rail lines were either meant to divide a community like in Austin or specifically removed people from their homes and built other things on top of them that were claiming to be community benefits. And we see that a lot, especially in the US, and we're trying really hard to make sure that, you know, if we can at least bury it and create park space and create walkable networks, that we are 
trying to, you know, seam back together a divide that's been really hard for the community for a hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the other things that we talked about, um, in our first episode was, uh, Zilker Park, which is part of your uh, district, and um, I think it is. I know the district sort of has sort of shifted a little bit. I'm, it is still okay. Great. Um, and uh, you and I had talked a little bit about. You know, we were basically we were just dreaming that you know maybe it doesn't have to be a motor speedway through the middle of the park. Uh, right. Bring us up to speed. What's what's going on with with Zilker Park? So right now, Zilker Park is undergoing a vision plan. The process was started a number of years ago through a working group where people said, you know, how how do we work with Zilker Park? It's hugely popular. It's home to ACL Fest, the Kite Festival, Trail of Lights. It's kind of our workhorse park as far as people who are visiting Austin want to see Barton Springs. They want to see you know the the skyline um, of downtown Austin and so it's really popular but what's happening is you know there's a lot of situations where there's too many cars it's slowing down traffic you know people worry about the foot traffic impact of having that many people in a space that that is you know designated as park space and so there's a couple different concepts coming out now about you know how do you increase Um, folks taking alternative transportation modes. Um, How many parking spaces are there? Should there be more? Should there be less? Um, You know, how do we create better bike lanes? How do we create better public transit? And so we're working through a lot of these issues. Um, And the bridge that leads directly into Barton, Barton, um, it goes over Barton Creek and leads you directly into Zilker Park is a historic bridge. And in, I think, 2015, there was a conversation where, you know, some people realized it, it is kind of acting as a thoroughfare. And there were some folks that wanted to widen it and a lot of other folks that didn't. And I myself, I live west of here. I come down this street to get home as well. But I get so irritated when I see people not respecting that space for people who are walking their dogs and pushing strollers in the narrow bike lanes. And, you know, even if you're a car driver, I always want to ask myself, expect that there's a puppy or a little kid somewhere because we know that puppies and little kids make impulse decisions and don't necessarily look both ways and, you know, know how to behave carefully in these situations and introducing cars into that has a huge level of risk. And so, there's, you know, pedestrian hybrid beacon. We're trying to fix the historic bridge, not having good bike lanes. Um, the bike lane as it exists on the right side of this slide, essentially the bike lane forces you into what is a bus lane. And it, it's not really well marked. And people have been working very hard to try um, to, to make this intersection better. So I think there's opportunity to say, you know, maybe cars are still invited into this space, but they need to slow down. This is a park, a very busy, active park. Um, And there needs to be some better transportation infrastructure, like doubling up the bus route. It's only 35 minutes per bus right now. So if you add a second bus, you've already cut that time in half. Um, And just making the bike lanes more inviting. So there's a lot of work that can be done in this space, but I look forward to seeing how the rest of the conversation plays out. Yeah. And this is one of the sort of visualizations, uh, you know, the the trees that you see in the middle of Barton Springs Road there don't currently exist. (laughs) So that that is a a visualization um, there. And it's a it's a it's an interesting conundrum and a a challenge. And it's not just, um, you know, that section that goes through the middle of the park. I mean, uh, that's the section that's part of your district, of course, but uh, the, the the rest of Barton Springs Road, as you head east, um, it, it's it's a mess too. And um, there there was recently a, a, a tragic crash there with somebody, you know, speeding and, 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 and basically, you know, crashing, you know, into one of our beloved little ice cream the trucks that that's right there and yeah it's very scary and it and it's uh, i i cross that street every single day um as i'm you know running errands and going to the grocery store um that's my main route and in fact that's the only dangerous spot that i have on my entire route because i can ride on quiet shared 
streets, like we were discussing earlier, in the neighborhood. But I do have to navigate across Barton Springs Road to be able to get to the trail network, which I use to then get to uh, the James D. Fluger Bike and Pedestrian Bridge to get over the Lady Bird Lake and then you know, make my way uh, up to Whole Foods to go grocery shopping. Um and so it's it's one of those things where, you know, inevitably I'm queued up at the crosswalk trying to get across the street and and folks are just blowing right through. They're not yielding to me. And I see so many uh, crashes there. And really, it comes to what we had talked about before, which is speed. It's mm-hmm. that it's like, you know, for some reason we, you know, as motor vehicle drivers and we all are motor vehicle drivers at some point in time, um, you know, when we get behind the, 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 you know, the wheel of a automobile so frequently, we just, we let our speeds get too high. And, and that's what I'm seeing on that street. And the fact right. that it does continue through in your district, through a park, it makes it like, as you mentioned, that it, it's just really scary. It is. And there's the bicycle accident that I had. It was a one person bicycle accident. So it wasn't a vehicular situation. There's no one else to blame, yeah. but I was trying to get around the fact that this bridge doesn't work. And if exactly. you're a relatively new cyclist, I've been doing it for a couple of years, but I still know that people are driving distracted, they're speeding, and I just don't feel safe doing it. And so I was using what is supposed to be the alternative yeah. bike path, but it's really clunky. And, and when I fell off my bike, it was because pedestrians, you know, three foot wide sidewalk, there's pedestrians walking side by side up. So I'm trying to move over to the right to be respectful of them. Yeah. And, you know, all of a sudden, because it's like a pecan tree grove, my front tire is sideways and I'm going over the handlebars and it it hurt. I mean, it yeah. took me two months not to have chest pain because my bicycle yeah. hit me in the chest on the way down. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so there's this conversation of is the infrastructure there? And if you looked at it on a map, you would say there's a whole separate bridge, but it's always crowded of people. The access to it is either no sidewalk or too narrow. Or your other option is to get in the bus lane over a historic bridge that's, you know, constantly needing to have the asphalt filled in just because of of it. And, you know, so there's a there's a big conversation. And when I mentioned earlier in 2015, there were some folks advocating for it to be wider. Um, When I tried to bring that into the four hundred sixty dollar mobility bond, there were some neighbors that said, you know, we said we didn't want a thoroughfare. And I didn't realize that was the conversation years ago. And once Mm -hmm. we really talked it out and said, I also don't want this to be a thoroughfare, but we need better space for bikes. And if that means reworking how the cars play in that space and how much they have leeway, I'm good with that. And so I think once we realized that my intent was, you know, to make it safer for bicyclists, and if that means narrower lanes for cars or fewer lanes for cars, uh, that needs to be a part of the conversation, but it's not functioning as it is. And so I think some of that historic context is helpful to know why are people fighting me trying to fix this bridge, but it was only concerns about a previous project that I had no knowledge of. And yeah. we realized we were actually all on on a similar page at the end. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And in, and in thinking through and, and having just listened to, to our previous conversation again earlier this morning, I was reminded that, you know, I, I pointed out that it is a major connector to Mopac. And then I start to th- question, you know, why would I even, you know, you know, give credit to that. I mean, it shouldn't necessarily be, there are other alternatives. Um, And so it shouldn't necessarily, we shouldn't just accept that it has to be a thoroughfare through there, a high speed thoroughfare, you know, maybe the real solution is, um, you know, bringing it down to one lane in each direction and bringing the motor vehicle speeds down and and making it a much more inviting environment um those are difficult decisions to to you know to make and those are you know interestingly enough it and that brings us around to uh your role as a city council member it's like how do you you know stick to your guns and have that political will to make those difficult decisions that may not make everybody happy. You know, political weight is always something that's hard to balance. There are things that are hugely popular. There's things that are hugely unpopular that are easy. What I've really found in four years of serving on the Austin city council is that 
it takes time to build trust and the more conversations you can have with people and really understand where they're coming from and what their concerns are, the better those conversations go. And I found that any, you know, any, any issue that comes up where there's people on one side or the other and they're disagreeing and they're all kind of playing tug of war of, you know, vote this way, vote that way. I usually take a step back and say, what are the common desires here? What are the values we're trying to, to build up? And is there a little bit on both sides where we can, you know, try to make a better result happen? And I think that's important in public policy. It's important in community relationships. But I think if people feel heard and they know where you're coming from and, and you know where they're coming from, that at the end of the day, maybe you know, what we ended up deciding isn't exactly what people wanted, but it got us most of the way there and is still workable. Um, so I, I think those are really important ways of addressing public policy um, in general. I think that's just a healthier community when you know your elected leaders are listening and willing to find compromise. And I have had to do this a lot on the dais. Um, so I've gotten pretty well practiced at really trying to figure out what, what's the problem we're trying to solve here and how can everybody get a win? If we're going to do something, I want everybody to feel like they've got some sort of win. Yeah. Yeah. So recently we had a rather special visit. Um, we had a, a, a royal visit, if you will. <laughs> so, um, I got to meet. Do you want to announce? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cue this up, and, and here she is. So who, who is this? This is Her Majesty, the Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, and she's a lovely individual, just very kind. Um, you know, we got a few moments to speak with her, but she is here. You know, that's our mayor. And they got to go on a bike ride and, and talk about the central library and how much it was inspired by, by Dutch, you know, infrastructure and, and practices. And so I, I just love that she came to Austin. There's me in the yeah. blue. <laughs> yeah. In fact, let's turn the volume up and listen to the mayor just a little bit. It's just so exciting to, to have you. Um, we want to welcome you back. We want to welcome you home to, to Austin. Uh, and, 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 uh, are excited that you're here and wanted to present this proclamation. Be it known that, whereas the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the city of Austin enjoy a long-standing cultural and economic friendship, working together on innovative and smart solutions to global challenges such as climate resilience and, and adapt, adaptation, mobility, energy, sports, and health, and whereas this year marks the 10-year anniversary of the city of Austin incorporating the core tenants of Dutch bikeway network design. Today, Austin is seen as an urban mobility innovator among its peers in North America. And whereas the design of Austin's central library is inspired by the Amsterdam Public Library, borrowing innovative ele elements that give the people of Austin unique ways to, to gather, to learn, to explore, and to play. And whereas the, this relationship uh, is celebrated through frequent exchange among Austin civic leaders and their Dutch counterparts, including this unprecedented visit to Austin on this day uh, in September by Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands. Now, therefore, I, Steve Adler, mayor of the city of Austin, Texas, on behalf of my entire council and the city manager and the assembled city of Austin staff, to hereby proclaim September 8th of the year 2022 as Netherlands Austin Friendship Day in Austin, Texas. Thank you so much. <laughs> and she rode her bike in that dress and those heels. I was very impressed. Just, just wait, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I, in fact, I'll let this play um, because we'll get a, 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 a few shots of her, her riding and... and uh, um, but I, I wanted to play this because the significance of this, in fact, is that that law on on going longstanding relationship that the city of Austin has had with the Dutch government and with the Dutch cycling embassy 
and the 10 year anniversary of the Think Bike workshop that took place um, back in 2012, obviously 10 year mm -hmm. anniversary. And um, there'll be a, an acknowledgement of that and a celebration of that um, in uh, the, the, the final week of, of October. So next week. Um, and so I, I think it was just, you know, very, very appropriate to, to, you know, be able to bring this up because there's there's some intentionality of trying to benchmark off of and study the concepts, the active mobility concepts of the leading nation globally in doing this quite well. And uh, it was just really, really cool to see this sort of acknowledgement of that special relationship. Look at her writing one handed and stepping in the grave. <laughs> It, so cool. Lovely. And I love that they are so willing to share yeah. what they've learned and how they've designed things because I've just really felt, you know, that they really want every every city that wants to do this to be able to implement these types of design changes. And so, you know, things really stuck with me from from that um, from that trip that we took in 2019 because they talk about, you know, interior neighborhood speeds versus connector road speeds to highway speeds and that you really should not be having, you know, these high speed traffic situations in a really dense downtown area or in the middle of a neighborhood. And they've done it with speed limit. You know, I think they only have like three speed limits. So you're either going low, medium or high. And that is right. it. You're not guessing. Is it 35, 30, 50, 50 you know, all these little increments. I was just going to say, and to jump in and say that, you know, that's a critical factor because we end up mixing and we have these kind of weird, you know, speed limits of, you know, it's, oh, it's 25 over here, but then it's 35 here and then it's 45 mm -hmm. over here. But if you're talking about an urban environment where you have a soft, squishy people involved, um, the fatality rates of 35, you know, 30 miles per hour, 35 miles per hour, 45 miles, we're talking about huge differences. You know, mm -hmm. when you're at 20 miles per hour, you're looking at a survival rate of 80 percent and then it flips. You know, when you're when you start getting into those higher rates of like 40 miles per hour, it's a 90 percent chance that you're going to die. So it, it's right. huge. Your point. And, and what's really tricky is that not you, you would think that, OK, for a slow speed limit street, they would all look the same. And a highway looks like a highway and an arterial looks like an arterial. But what we see, especially in my district, is some of the neighborhoods were built with big, wide streets and they look like you should be going 50. So I'm trying to get creative. You know, we usually think about how do we narrow the streets from the outside? Can we pave a bike lane? You know, can we put in pylons or other, you know, flexible material to just visually shorten that space like you see in some of the crosswalks that you put into these images? Um, but at the same time, I've started to wonder, should we be building from the center out? Can we put medians in there, bring more trees and, and native plants, you know, back into the environment? And that could be another way of narrowing the street lanes on each side. So I've just started thinking about with these big wide streets, you know, how how do we how do we fix them if they're in the middle of a neighborhood and the speed limit is 25 miles an hour, but you looks like you should be able to drive 50 and you can as long as there's no one else around and then when someone's around obviously you've got a really big situation a big tragic situation could occur and so I, I'm, we're still playing with how do we solve those bad road practices from decades ago that are no longer serving the community and they're unsafe yeah i have an idea what's that so we love our live oaks here in uh -huh. central texas right Yes. Let's let's, let's plant a, a nice mature live oak in every single one of those uh, residential uh, intersections, right smack dab let's in the it. middle of it. I'm I'm game. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really think, you know, there's a neighborhood that I have um, that one side of the street has big, beautiful trees. You know, old oak trees. Yeah. They're able to plant plants. Their front doors are. 10 or 15 degrees cooler than the house on the other side of the street. And it has to do with the angle of the sun and the other side of the street has, you know, their trees have died, their grass is, you know, yellow. Um, and so I think there is something we could do for these big wide streets to help with that tree canopy and help with the heat Island effect that roads create and really try to bring that back into the conversation. And so I, I, I think there's some room for work here that I'm yeah. excited to get to do. 
Yeah, I'm only I'm only half joking with that, by the way, folks. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, because uh, ultimately, what makes it seem like a motor speedway is that you have that long, you know, visual, and you're just like, oh yeah, it's it's wide and it just stretches on forever, and you know, being able to, you know, like you said, maybe it's maybe it's doing something in the middle, and then you know, really trying to bring that the motor vehicle speeds down. I think Page. so in your neighborhood in particular, I'm always jealous about the use of roundabouts and trees and you're trying to say, how, how can we get something more like this, you know, in some of the Southwest Austin neighborhoods, because it does, it's beautiful and it slows cars down and makes it safer for bikes and pedestrians. Yeah. And not so much in my neighborhood in Zilker West, we're, we're lacking those, but across Lamar over in the Bolden neighborhood, they've done a wonderful job of those, uh, wonderful traffic calming, uh, uh, traffic circles with trees and other things, uh, you know, planted in the middle. Um, I'd love for that to be in, in our neighborhood here. So maybe I'll have to work on that. <laughs> yeah. I try to stay out of that. <laughs> so, uh, Paige, we've come to the end, but I want to give you an opportunity to, to have the last word. Is there anything that we haven't discussed yet that you really want to leave the audience with? I think we've covered a, a good range of the issues that we're working on, but it's very clear, even though we've made really big steps over the past 10 years, that there's still a lot of work to be done. So I, I think, you know, we've got to have this momentum. We've got to keep it going because um, if we lose the momentum and try to build it again, it could be another decade before some of these these tactics are implemented. So we have a huge need in our community for better bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, safer streets. You know, I've been fortunate to get to work on a number of these issues in the first four years of my term and hope to accomplish so much more in the next four years to really set us up for success, you know, fight climate change, keep our air quality and water quality clean here in the city of Boston. And it's been amazing to get to work with such good partners and innovators for the first couple of years. Yeah, yeah. And to your point, um, when we look at this uh, Dutch inspired cycle network, um, we're about 50% done. So we're only halfway there. So to your point. Yeah, that's that's a huge momentous occasion to get to celebrate 50%. But let's let's get the rest of the way. Yeah, I hear it. I hear you. That's good <laughs> stuff. Paige Ellis, City Council Member District 8, running for office again. Uh, for those of you tuning in, uh, watching and, and listening to this, uh, get out there and vote. <laughs> Early voting starts next week. And uh, we're so incredibly grateful to have you out there on the dais, working hard uh, for all of us here in the, in the city of Austin. Uh, Paige, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast once again. Thanks for letting me join you. I always appreciate the conversation. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Council Member Paige Ellis, District 8 Council Member here in the city of Austin, Texas. And if you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and, uh, and share it with a friend. And if you are a voter here in uh, Austin, Texas, uh, early voting starts next week. So make sure that uh, you uh, cast your vote. Make sure your voice is heard. And if you're a voter in Council District 8, I hope you will consider Paige in her re-election bid. Hey, and just a quick reminder, I will be in the Netherlands uh, next week attending the International Cargo Bike Festival, so there will not be an episode on Friday the 28th. However, I will have one uh, out uh, while I'm still Still <laughs> traveling around the Netherlands. I will have an episode coming up uh, the following Friday. I think that's November 4th, if I remember correctly. Again, thank you so very much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Uh, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Also sending out a big thank you to all my amazing Active Towns ambassadors who are directly supporting my efforts through Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Chats, uh, making purchases from the Active Towns store, and also donating to the nonprofit. Thank you all so very much. I simply could not do this without you.